That's a reel called The Pinch of Snuff, and there's a story about it. You know these rambling houses or kailing houses in every community, in Ireland, in the country, in England too, I'm sure, and everywhere else. Um, funny thing, I've never found out why any particular house is selected as the rambling house of a community. Uh, it's not for the sake of the tea and bread and jam or whatever it is. Or a rambling house could be away a mile up a boarding, not for necessity central. And uh, this rambling house I'm going to tell you about was owned by a bachelor who lived by himself. And in winter nights they'd have their Kaylee round the fire, smoking and yarning and talking and the odd song and the odd joke and local news and gossip. And in summertime, there was a grand green grass ward at the gable end of the house, and they used to have their Kaylee there right till nightfall. Well, this night at nightfall, they all said goodnight to each other, knocked the duttle out of their pipes, and the bachelor man was going in home to bed for himself, when a little man appeared beside him. I hear you're a great man, he says, for the frakes and the frolics and for the tunes and the music and the songs and the dance and the drink and the ladies and all that. And why not, says the man. Well, he said, I'm one of the little people. I can see that, says the man. Well, I came here, he said, to invite you to a great spree that's on tonight. It's a wedding spree. And we're going there. We want to take the bride-to-be away with us. And... We have to make her sneeze three times without anybody saying healing or God bless us or anything like that. If we succeed in doing that, we're away with her and we leave somebody else in her place. But we can't do this unless we have a mortal with us. And that's why I'm here to invite you to come to the spree. There'll be plenty to drink and plenty to eat there and plenty of dancing and fun. Good music and all. All right, says the man, I don't mind. And away they flew in the air, and they landed in this house, and the place they landed was in the rafters above. And the hugger and mugger and cugger and the little men above, and they all set themselves on the cross beams. And then two little men together. There she is now, says one of them. You see that one there with the black hair and the blue dress? That's the one. All right, said the little man. And he had a little box of snuff ready, and he took a pinch. And they were dancing the set, and when the chain around came, she came round right under him, and he dropped the pinch of snuff down right under her nostrils, and she sneezed. And with the music and the dancing, nobody noticed, and nobody said yelling or God bless you or anything. That's one of them, says the little man. And he had a pinch of snuff ready for the next time she came round. He dropped it, and she sneezed, and nobody said yelling or God bless you or anything. That's two of them, says the little man, no. Well, my man, poor fellow, opened the rafters with them. He was beginning to think this was a queer kind of caper he was out on altogether. He was beginning to disapprove of it, and his conscience was pricking him, you know. And she danced the third time around. Little man dropped the pinch of snuff, and she sneezed. Yelling is my lad, says the man in the rafters, and he was dropped down amongst the whole crowd. They were all dancing. And there was amazement and consternation. Who are you, and what were you doing up there, and you're a stranger, and all this. And he silenced them all and he explained how the fairies had taken him there to bring this young lady away, the bride-to-be, to take him with him and leave somebody in their place. And that if he hadn't said yielding as much that on the third sneeze, she'd be gone. They were very thankful to him and uh, they wined and dined him. I don't know how far he was from home or how he got home. But uh, the point of the story is that the tune that the paper was playing when all this caper was going on was called The Pinch of Snow. Now there's another tune, The Fairy's Hornpipe, and there's a story about it. And this tune was acquired from the fairies, as the story tells it. It's about a man who was at a spree one night, and with all the dancing and all the drinking and the late hour coming home, he decided to take a shortcut home through the fields. And uh, he was travelling and he thought it was a long time he was getting home. And then he began to find himself arriving back at the same place every time. And he knew then that it was a Shachran Shi had come on, a, a fairy strain. And the old people tell you 
that if that ever happens to you, what you do is take off your jacket, turn it inside out, and put it on inside out, and you'll find out immediately where you are and find your way home. Believe it or not, it happened to me one night driving a car. I got out of the car eventually, coming back to the same crossroads every time, got out of the car and turned my jacket, just for the lack of it, and found my way straight away. <laughs> That's beside the point. Uh, this man turned his jacket inside out and directly found himself within three fields of home at the top of a long field. And he walked down the field and he heard the music. And then, it was kind of a bright night, he saw the uh, fairies dancing and heard the piper playing. And dawn was coming, summer time. He sat down on a hillock and he could see them plainer and listening to the music of the piper. And they were dancing this hornpipe when he fell asleep. And when he woke up, the sun was high in the sky and the fairies were all gone. And he went in home, two fields more. And there were early risers, they were up. And what kept you out till this hour of the night? And he told them the whole story, coming in with your jacket turned inside out like that, just to make it look good. They wouldn't believe him at all, that he was sleeping it off in some ditch or other, and, or maybe that he was out courting a lassie. But he said, no, he said, I'm telling the truth and I can prove it to you, because the hornpipe that the piper was playing when I fell asleep, I memorised it and I can play it for you. And he did, and they believed him because that was a hornpipe that was never played or heard by anybody in the old people in all the surrounding district. Uh, a very pleasant little tune, the fairy's hornpipe. Here's another tune. Uh, this one was given by a fairy piper to a man. It's a double jig called the gold ring. This man was walking in the forest one day and he heard music in the distance. And he walked toward the music where he heard it coming from. As he drew nearer, it grew louder, and he knew he was getting nearer to it, and he found himself then behind a clump of bushes. And he peeped out through the bushes, and he saw the fairies dancing and the piper playing in broad daylight in a little bit of a glade and clearance in the forest. And. Uh, he was me crazy mad about music, you know, and oh, so charmed to see the fairies and to hear the piper, the fairy piper playing. And he was jogging a bit maybe with the, the rhythm of the tune, maybe disturbed the bushes that way, or maybe he peered out too far from the bushes and they saw his face. And whatever, whatever happened, he just, they spotted him anyway and disappeared. And he was the sorry man. You know, he, he should have kept quiet and he'd be there listening to him still. He walked down to the place where they were dancing and he was looking at the tracks of their little feet in the ground where they were dancing and, and still the honing and mourning to himself with pity that he disturbed the bushes. And didn't he spot a gold, little gold ring? Now this ring was a beautiful little ring, gold engraved. And it was so small that it would I suppose it would fit, as I was told the story, on the little finger of an infant. And he said, this must belong to them. Well, now he had heard that down at the far end of the forest, there was an ivy-grown granite cliff, and that the fairies dwelt in that cliff. So the old people had it. So he said it's rolled down that way, and he went down, and he kicked... Like he'd kick the, the heel, no, he'd kick the cliff with the heel of his boot. And little man hopped out and he said, What's all the kicking and hoisting about going on? Oh, I'm very sorry, said the man. I'm the man who disturbed you up there while you were dancing. And I was looking at the tracks of your feet where you were dancing and I found this little gold ring and I thought it must belong to you. And I heard that you dwelt around here and I came down to see could I find you and give you back the ring. Well, thank you very much, said the little man. Now, for returning that ring to us, we grant you one wish. Anything at all that's within our power, you just wish for it and we would grant it to you. Well, as I told you before, the man was stark, crazy about music. And he wasn't very long till he decided what he wanted. He said, what I would like is to know and be able to play that jig that the piper was playing when I disturbed the bushes. That's fine, says the man, that's easily done, he says. I was the piper, 
and he popped into the cliff and he popped out again with a little set of pipes and he played up the tune. And the old people said that the fairies, if they wanted you to take a tune, all they had to do was play it once through for you and you had it perfectly forever afterwards. Well, he got the tune and it is called The Gold Ring Ever Since. There's a, a lovely old song. We haven't got it completely. It's called Shachran Shi, the fairy strain. Shachran Shi van Nam Sunihe. A fairy strain happened to me in the night. And my people say that it's not true. But by all the Bibles that were ever written, I spent that night at a feast. And I, another fragment says, I didn't pay much attention in what people were saying until I saw the couple go hand in hand into the door of the room. And uh, Maeve was the girl's name. It was his own sweetheart who was taken away by the fairies. And the uh, appearance of a smile was not on her face. Uh, Patrick Hannibal of Ardmore whistled it and sang just that fragment of it for me. And it's a, a very nice, simple, slow air and must be very ancient. That's The Lark in the Morning, a very well-known tune among Irish musicians. Now, the older people call that The Lark's March and uh, that isn't exactly the way they had it. There's a story about it. There was a lad one time in Ireland, West Coast, I presume, Colomel Creon, out in Glinsk and Connemara, told me the story. And his name was Henry Bohannon. And he was trying to play the pipes, trying to learn the pipes, and he was making a very bad fist of them all together. And he used to go fishing off a rock in the deep water down below, fishing for rock fish or fish or whatever he could catch. And one day, a little fairy man appeared beside him and he said, tell me, Henry, why is it that no matter whether you get a good catch of fish or you get no fish at all, you still have the gloomy look on your face, the dissatisfaction? Well, I tell you the truth, Henry said, I'm trying to play the pipes and he's beating me altogether. I can't make a fist of them. And it's not the fish I'm worried about, it's the pipes. Well, said the little man, I can soon cure that for you, he said. I can give you the gift of piping. He said, tell me, Henry, which would you prefer, music to please yourself and nobody else, or music to please everybody and not please yourself? Oh, Henry said, I think I'd prefer music to please myself and nobody else. All right, said the little man, you go home and at midnight tonight, have the pipes yoked up already, and when the clock strikes twelve, on the last stroke of the clock, you blow up the pipes and you'll have fine music that'll please yourself. You'll be very pleased with yourself. And he disappeared, and Henry went home, and he was watching the clock, and at midnight he had the pipes yoked up, and on the last stroke of midnight he blew up the pipes and he played away the sweetest music he ever thought he heard in his life. But nobody took any notice of him. Just thought there's Henry still learning, still trying to play the pipes and so on. After a while, Henry caught on to this, that he was pleasing himself but nobody else. And he'd be out fishing again and he'd have the gloomy look on his face. No matter he, whether he caught a good haul of fish or not, he was still dissatisfied. And the little man appeared to him again. Ah, uh, so you're not satisfied, Henry, he said. No, said Henry, I'm not. I'm sorry I didn't take the other choice. Ah, well, I'll give it to you, said the little man. Be ready at the last stroke of midnight tonight, he says, and blow up your pipes, and you'll have music that'll please everybody, and you won't be take, making any value on it yourself at all. Henry was ready at the stroke of midnight, he blew up the pipes, and he played music. And shortly after that, people got to listen to Henry. And everybody came to hear Henry. And Henry became famous all around the place. So much so 
That even he was invited to the houses of the nobility to play, out when they were having balls and parties and feasts and festivals and that. And one man there took such a fancy to Henry's pipe, piping that he took Henry in as the resident piper of his own castle or manor or whatever it was. And uh, Henry was there to teach the girls, the young ladies, dance and decorum and deportment and so on. And of course, dressed up in the black, the piper's black and white starched front and bow tie and hard hat. And Piper, of course, was a nobleman that time when he was a nobleman's piper. Well, it happened anyway that his master was over in London on a visit. And he was at uh, some kind of a ball or party, and the English nobleman had a piper. And he asked the Irishman, what do you think of my piper? Not very much indeed, says the Irishman. I have a piper at home that play rings round me then. You have not, says the Englishman. Well, indeed I have, says the Irishman. How much will you bet? And the bet was laid, the arrangement made, and they sent for Henry. And Henry came over. And the competition started. Now, in those days, to be a nobleman's resident piper, you had to be a very good piper. And it wasn't on your piping alone that the adjudication was decided. It was on the repertoire of the pipers as well. And these two pipers played tune for tune all night long until in the finish, neither of them had a tune left to play. And it looked like there was going to be neither the winner, the one would be as good as the other. And Henry was racking his brains for another tune. And he strolled out in the morning air and he lit his pipe. And didn't he hear the lark above him in the sky? And he listened to the lark a while and he got the inspiration. And he went in and he buckled down the pipes and blew them up and he played the tune which is called the Lark's March and won the competition. <laughs> <laughs>